The following content is provided by MIT OpenCourseWare under a Creative Commons license. Additional information about our license and MIT OpenCourseWare in general is available at ocw.mit.edu. Okay. Ready? Okay. So, welcome to the, the third phase of our omics discussion. Someone pointed out that I should point out the shirt says omics, not comics. Uh, <laughs> so we've t covered genomics and last time transcriptomics, and today we introduce a very important all-inclusive subject of proteomics. Uh, we'll connect it to last week's through the vehicle of focusing on motifs that are involved in protein interactions with the uh, two nucleic acid macromolecules. So we're going we're to be covering, just as we uh, introduced RNA omics with RNA structure, we're going to spend this entire class talking about protein three-dimensional structure, how you get at it experimentally and computationally, and its implications for the binding of small <coughs> molecules such as drugs. Uh, we will, in short order, get to the scary uh, uh, pumpkin-like molecule. So the connection to last uh, week was this, this diagram showing palindromicity in three cases and a direct repeat in, in the fourth case. And I offered that this might reflect the symmetry of the proteins, of the three-dimensional structure of the proteins and the three-dimensional structure of the nucleic acid and these symmetry elements would align. Now, in order to introduce these symmetry elements and the possibility of having codes that you can at least program, uh, even if they may have been tinkered about during uh, evolution, the question is to what extent can we get our hands on these kind of protein and nucleic acid motifs that interact? In order to, to get at this issue of where there is a code, and I just take this as one of the ways of dealing with the uh, incredible complexity of proteins is to give this a theme that connects it to last class uh, and connects, I think, to many of the sentiments of people in this sort of audience uh, interested in, in computational biology is, is ways of having simple codes. And of course, the way of, one way of breaking up proteins and thinking about them is these ABCs, the alpha helix, the beta sheet, and the coil. Each of these uh, can be characterized by the hydrogen bonds that hold it together, the weak bonds between the, the uh, hydrogens, uh, the nitrogens, and the oxygens. Uh, in the alpha helix, these are all kept within the helix uh, with a repeat of uh, 3.6 residues per turn. In the beta sheet, they tend to have uh, the, a longer, straighter uh, uh, chains, where there are unpaired uh, hydrogen bonds inevitably until you form enough chains to form a uh, cyclic structure, while the alpha helix is immediately helical. Uh, there are many different types of coils. It's a catch-all phrase that includes everything except alpha and beta, but a particularly well-formed type of coil, which has its own nomenclature and, and parameters, is the turn, and the turn is illustrated here at the end of, of a beta sheet. Uh, it, a beta sheet basically is going in on the lower right-hand corner in the direction of the arrow. The arrows typically fo point from the N-terminus to the C-terminus, uh, just as in nucleic acids, was from 5' prime to 3'. Prime. And here it goes in the arrow, turns around very tightly, and goes back out again. Okay. Now, how can we use these basic motifs? These are the smallest meaningful units of protein three-dimensional structure. How can we use these to recognize other macromolecules, other proteins, and nucleic acids. So let's connect this to the motifs of last class. We had these uh, motifs that we could find weight matrices for them by aligning lots of sequences. Now instead of aligning sequences, let's see what we can do by uh, mutating both the protein part and the nucleic acid part. And in order to do this, just as, this, as an illustration, let's say we had three zinc fingers. This is a real uh, human and mouse uh, uh, DNA binding protein uh, with three zinc fingers in a row. So this, this is an example of the direct repeat or tandem repeat type of symmetry. Remember, there's a direct repeat and the inverted repeat. And in this tandem repeat, let's anchor the two ends and change the middle. 
make every possible peptide sequence in the middle or, or, or randomly sample the vast uh, space that might occur in changing uh, uh, a, a few, say, six or more key amino acids. And then we know from the, the uh, three-dimensional structure that it interacts mainly with the middle three nucleotides. So let's change those middle three nucleotides to every possible trinucleotide sequence and see quantitatively how much that th the different uh, sequences in the protein affect the different sequences in the nucleic acid. So this is not going to be by staring at long sequence alignments where we're going to get the weight matrices. We're going to get them by actual experimental measures of the binding in vitro. And so what happens when you do this exercise, the wild type, now this, the wild type sequence is something that may want to recognize a family of sequences. We don't know exactly what the wild type sequences for this particular DNA binding protein, this zinc finger from human and mouse. But the sequence of the business end, the amino acid sequence of that recognition alpha helix that's binding into the major groove of DNA is shown in the upper left, RSDHLTT. And the sequence that it mainly binds to, remember this is a weight matrix, it's not a consensus sequence, it's TGG. It obviously recognizes a variety of other sequences. And remember, there's, there's about three nucleotides on either side of it that the other two zinc fingers bind to. When you try all 64 possible trinucleotides, remember from the genetic code, this is pure coincidence that these are triplets the same as the genetic code. It just happens to be the amount of the chunk of DNA that, that a zinc finger will cover. But, but it's not coincidence that four to the third is still 64 just like the genetic code. And if you run through all, th all possible uh, nucleotide sequences for this wild type, you find the winner is TGG, and it has that particular binding constant. The binding constant is measured in, in the, the molarity, roughly where you get half maximal uh, or equilibrium binding. Uh, that's 10 to the minus 9 moles per liter. You can now mutagenize the peptide and select for peptides that bind to GCC, Remember, the flanks are kept constant. You get two peptides, both bind to the GCC. They both give weight matrices very similar to this um, with, some, with, with very, these are very high affinity binding constants, just like with wild type. So you've essentially engineered, by selection, a new specificity and two different ways of getting it. If you now go for something radically different, now, no GC, the, the first one was uh, high GC, the second was pure GC, and then the third one is pure AT, and you get another, uh, another peptide sequence that binds to that, and you get another weight matrix. Now remember, this weight matrix is not sequence alignment. This is uh, binding constants, where the weighting of the, of the 64 different sequences is based on how much uh, binding you get for each of the 64. And then for some sequences, all these different trinucleotides all result in a rather poor selection for any kind of peptide out of all the vast number of peptides you could have. None of them do particularly well, and the result is a weight matrix here, um, which has very little information content. So, so this is a way, it's not the only way, but this is a way of getting a really good empirical data set, which will, in principle, you can combine it with, with similar functions on the flanking ones, and you can create, you can dial up any sequence uh, of a nucleic acid protein interaction at least with this class of proteins. Others are, are a little more problematic. But you can see how this, you can generate a code even if the, the actual detailed amino acid nucleotide interaction is not so simple. So that, that, those are the results of the study. Then I'll show you just a snapshot of a, a, a schematic of how the actual experiments are done. And then finally, I'll show you a little math behind how we got those apparent binding constants. Remember, in those lower binding constant means it goes to, you can get the uh, binding at a lower concentration, which means it's stronger binding. So the way you do the binding here is you take a, uh, a nucleic acid array, simple, similar to the ones we've been talking about in last class. Instead of being single-stranded, ready to bind fluorescent nucleic acid, it's double-stranded, ready to bind a fluorescent protein complex. The protein complex, in this case, is a... a uh, bacteriophage, which is displaying the three zinc fingers in red. The middle one is the one that in the past slide was mutagenized. And uh, similarly, the array is combinatoric. Every possible DNA sequence uh, that you're interested in is present. Uh, 
and, and what you do is you quantitate the fluorescence of the, of the zinc finger uh, protein indirectly by it, the binding of the covalently attached phage to the antibodies which are fluorescently labeled by phycoerythrin. The quantity, how you relate the fluorescence, the more binding, the more fluorescence. But how you relate that to the, to the binding constant we had in the previous slide is the subject of this uh, slide number eight. Now, we call this the apparent equilibrium association constant because these experiments, just like many uh, binding in, in, in living cells, is not at equilibrium. It's a dynamic process in the cell and in vitro. Uh, there are ways that you can measure the, the, the equilibrium constant, but, but what this is is apparent in the sense that you need to wash off the excess fluorescence in order to detect the fairly low signal that you get from the binding, uh, the specific binding, rather than having fluorescence. You, you bathe it with 10 to the 6th fold excess of fluorescence. And so as you're doing that wash, you're obviously not at equilibrium. In the end, you take a snapshot before you wash off everything. And, uh, and so what you're measuring, if you, what you're basically measuring is, attempting to measure is the equilibrium constant between protein P in the uh, upper left here, DNID, double-stranded, um, going to the product, which is this P dot D uh, as associated uh, by molecular product. And this is, uh, this is basic uh, physical chemistry and algebra. So, that, so you rearrange that to get the uh, association constant. That's what you want. And the fraction of DNA molecules with protein bound can be, re can be found from this. It's just... Uh, uh, by definition, the fraction of DNA molecules protein bound is the, the, the protein bound is the numerator. The brackets mean concentration in moles per liter, just like we stated. And then divide the, the complex by the amount of the fraction, which is the total uh, DNA, which is the DNA present in the complex and the DNA that's free. That's the D plus PD. And then you just substitute in this definition of the association constant. The definition is product over reactants. And, uh, and then you get this intermediate term, which now you cancel out all the concentrations of Ds, and then you end up with the last term on the far right, which is uh, where if you hold the protein, if the protein concentration is known, then, then the whole thing is constant except for the association. So that one over the association constant is directly related to the fraction of DNA molecules with protein bound, which is uh, directly proportional to the signal intensity in fluorescence. So this is how you get the, the numbers that were on that slide. Now let's return the question that, that connected this talk with the last one, which was the symmetry of uh, DNA protein interactions. This, we illustrated already one of these three zinc finger complexes, as illustrated on the left-hand side of the side uh, here, the, 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 the double-stranded DNA is in blue, and the three zinc fingers follow along the major groove, the large groove of the DNA. Um, and the, the reason this, the textbook is, is wrong, first of all, it emphasizes the non-helical part of the zinc finger. You can barely see the helix in the background there. And also, the way it loops through the DNA, if you look at this carefully in your textbook, this is actually the mount book, uh, it actually interdigitates with a phosphodiester bond, basically going through the base pairs, which is not at all what happens. Similarly, the leucine zipper, this is, a, again, recognition with a helix in the major groove of DNA. Um, here you can see that the helix that causes the dimerization of proteins, you can think of this as a as your really most elementary protein-protein interaction code. A very fundamental one that comes again and again, so-called coil-coil, two alpha helices interacting. They, they, they direct extension of that, almost coaxial with a coil-coil of protein-protein interaction. They go down and touch the DNA. In contrast, the textbook, where it does this sharp right-hand turn and in some way uh, poorly, schematic, poorly schematized there, it goes coaxial with the DNA. That's not what happens. It's the protein, the, the uh, helices are more or less direct extensions down from the dimerization region of the protein, uh, maintaining almost perpendicular to the DNA axis. Okay. 
But again, so the, on the left is the three tandem repeats, and on the right is a dyad axis, where the twofold 180 degrees symmetry, think of it as rotating exactly uh, 180 degrees. This is not a mirror, this is a rotation of the DNA on itself also coincides perfectly with the twofold symmetry of the, of the protein association with itself. These are the two major symmetry classes, and it's amazing how, how many nucleic acid protein interactions fall into one of these two classes, direct repeat or inverted repeat. And that's why when you find direct and inverted repeats in nucleic acid sequences, you get a little excited. The other reason is, uh, is the hairpin structures that you found in RNA that we talked about in the last classes, um, those also are indicated by inverted repeats. But, okay, so we now have a, a, a semi-empirical way of computing, of, in a certain sense, predicting new regulatory protein DNA interactions of double-stranded DNA. Can we extend this to RNA? This is a much more complicated uh, situation with RNA because you don't have these long, perfect double helices anymore. You have these very short RNA helices that I showed in the last couple of classes. This is transfer RNA, one of our favorite molecules here, with the anticodon at the bottom of each of the pink structures and the amino acid acceptor, three prime end of that 70-some nucleotide, uh, 70 to 80 nucleotide nucleic acid. So the pinks are all the tRNAs, and there are at least 20 different types of amino acid and has 20 types of, at least 20 types of transfer RNAs and 20 types of proteins that add the amino acid onto the three prime end of the transfer RNA. These break themselves up into two major classes. These can be recognized at the structural level, class one, which is the single letter amino acid code, C, E, L, so forth, cysteine, glutamate, and so on. That's one class which are structurally similar. Class two is structurally dissimilar to class one, but they're similar within the class. Anyway, the point is that they recognize all different parts of the nucleic acid, not just the anticodon, which is the, the code itself, the trinucleotide code, not just the amino acid end where you need to recognize amino acid, and, uh, but various points along the transfer RNA. If you wanted to create a new code, as this, these authors have, or to create uh, hybrids between these various things, you'd have to find homology among the proteins or graph domains of recognition between each one or mutagenize particular regions that are known to interact with the nucleotides you want to, to contact. And that's, that's been done. You can arrange to make a new amino acid by carving the, the, uh, uh, the pocket the amino acid recognizes and uh, grafting on the appropriate uh, nucleotides that uh, the appropriate amino acids would recognize, say, a stop codon. Okay, you've had uh, some programming experience that hopefully will prepare you for the world, real world of, of interacting with uh, input and output uh, from various devices. Uh, the topic today is proteins, and this really is the main uh, contact between the exquisite regulatory mechanisms, which will be the topic of the network that we've already touched upon, but will really be the top work topic of some of our network analysis in the next, uh, in the last three lectures. Here, we need sensors to sense the environment. We need actuators to then deliver back into the environment what the, what the cell wants to do or to interact with other cells. You have to have feedback, synchrony, and so on, you that, that you can basically program the almost digital uh, nucleic acid world inside the cell, um, but via an clearly analog inputs and outputs. So, uh, since you know this is the Halloween uh, lecture, uh, and I'm uh, masquerading as the Wolfman, uh, we we also I've listed some of the scariest uh, proteins that I could think of, and we're going to talk about uh, three of them. One of them in the slide, which is the, uh, the, the proteins that are actually involved in causing the symptoms that come from uh, when you're worried about anthrax. And then we'll talk about uh, HIV yet again, this time polymerase mutants that, that cause drug resistance. 
and then APOE, yet again, as we have in the past, this time talking specifically about pr how protein structure tells us the haplotype. So with anthrax, you start out with this simple uh, two component, uh, two protein domains here. They bind to a cellular, some, something on your cell surface, hopefully not yours, but human cell surface. Um, and then one of the domains disappears, and the remaining one now self-assembles into a sevenmer, sevenfold symmetry. Remember, we were talking about two-fold rotational symmetry for the DNA protein interaction, and this is now sevenfold rotational symmetry. That now allows this lethal factor, LF, to bind, still not inside the cell, but the whole, the whole complex gets internalized. Still, topologically, it's as if it were outside the cell when it's inside this little vesicle. It has to get through that membrane. But now, the pH change that happens when this vesicle goes in the cell, part of the natural cell with biological processes, causes this unfortunate un un act where now the seven, seven this complex of proteins does yet another conformational change and turns into this hairy beast that allows the, the lethal factor to get into your cell and kill it. So you can see that, that when we're talking about protein three-dimensional structure, whether we're predicting it or solving it, protein is not a static object. Here it associates with one factor, it associates uh, seven of itself, it interacts with lethal factor, it opens up a n whole new channel and a membrane, etc. You need to think of these as dynamic systems with many different states. We also need to think about time scales. Many of the, the molecular mechanics we'll be talking about, the time scale of relevance is a femtosecond. You need to be able, this is uh, or two nanoseconds, so 10 to the minus 15, 10 to the minus 9 seconds. That's atomic motion. The turnover of an enzyme uh, is, the, is the time it takes to, for a small molecule, say, to bind, to find and bind the enzyme to, to, to possibly go through a catalytic step and to dissociate as a product. Uh, that's on the order of microseconds to milliseconds. In the second range is the time that it takes the molecule, to t the drug or small molecule, to touch the surface of the cell, maybe diffuse across the cell, and find its target. Transcription that we talked about, all the regulatory mechanisms of transcription last time, the rate of the constant for that process is around 50 nucleotides per second. Coincid not entirely coincidentally, that's about the rate at which uh, it is translated into protein. These are important numbers because a typical gene size piece, say after uh, RNA splicing in higher organisms or, in, or, or naturally, it might be a kilobase, so that's about a half a minute to transcribe and translate. That could be used as the timer in a circuit of these longer time things, time frames, like uh, cell cycle, circadian rhythm, uh, very long time frames uh, in ecological systems with, with bamboo and, uh, and, and various pests, uh, which, can, which can be uh, not even yearly. And then a development and aging, which can be on the order of hundreds of years, at least for humans, uh, turtles and whales. Okay. So, what we think proteins are good for depends on the accuracy. And the accuracy depends on the method. At the very bottom right, we have uh, a very appealing approach, which is de novo, a priori, or, or ab initio prediction of, secondary, uh, of protein three-dimensional structure from the sequence alone, which we're getting in bucket loads from the genome projects. But unfortunately, accuracy so far, and we'll delve into this in more detail in a moment, is on the order of six angstroms uh, difference between the predicted structure and what it actually is by the more precise methods up higher on this. The uh, y-axis here, the, the vertical axis, is basically percent sequence identity as you start doing, say, threading or comparative modeling um, here as you get up instead of the uh, ab initio or de novo prediction doesn't require any sequence similarity. If you want to build it based on previously solved structures, you need at least 30%, but you're still uh, very far, say, three to four angstroms away from the uh, native structure. As you get to one angstrom or better in your accuracy as you can get from NMR and X-ray crystallography, you now are in a position to study catalytic mechanism and design and improve ligands such as drugs. This is really where we want to be.
there may be a day where we can do this all from ab initio prediction or modeling at very great distances. But for now, modeling at very short, uh, say 80 to 90 percent amino acid similarity is important. Remember, there's a, just like there's a variety of different protein structures. Uh, this is just an example of a, of a vast literature that exists where you can use uh, some of the methods that we'll be discussing uh, from in, this, in this class on, on uh, doing molecular mechanics on proteins and predicting their three-dimensional structure in complex with the various drugs. We will contrast this or show the interplay of the computational biology that can be aided by actual uh, measurements of drug binding, just as we had actual measurements of zinc finger binding to double-stranded DNA. And ways that you can discover this, the small molecules by a, a clever use of parts of it that you know bind and parts of it uh, that you know might uh, be variable in a chemical sense. Uh, now this is what just as there is this dynamic competition between uh, pathogens and their hosts, there's, there's this uh, similar lethal game that's played between uh, pathogens and the pharmaceutical industry. And uh, here, HIV, for which there are many drugs now aimed either at the protease or at the uh, polymerase. Some of the first ones were aimed at the polymerase. And so we have a big collection. This is one of the most sequenced molecules on Earth, which is the HIV uh, gene encoding the reverse transcriptase polymerase. And it's been sequenced many times because as a patient takes the drugs, the, the, their population of AIDS virus changes. And each of these little diamond-shaped substitution sites clustered around the binding site in the protein. The binding site here indicated the substrate is in space filling, which is the triphosphate on the, on the upper left, uh, and the, the template kind of curving around on the right-hand side of that space-filling um, bright green structure. Uh, the protein is, 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 a, is in red, and these little diamonds indicate substitutions, where the nomenclature is single-letter code for the wild type, the n position in amino acids from the N-terminus is the number, and then the, the third uh, or the last uh, far-right letter is the new amino acid. So, for example, D67N means aspartate at position 67 in wild type changes to an asparagine, and that causes a drug resistance in uh, the HIV with unfortunate consequences for the patient. Um, we can take, now, making mutations in polymerases is not entirely of negative consequences. And I'm going to show you a really beautiful example where a, a DNA polymerase, a very similar kind of dynamic, where you're, you, the DNA polymerase, you want to change it so that it can now uh, handle a, an inhibitor, what would normally be an inhibitor of DNA polymerase, um, a, a class of uh, nucleotides that is incapable of extending capable of incorporated into to the growing, um, replicating genome, of, of, uh, but is not capable of extending, is a powerful inhibitor, and is also a powerful sequencing reagent, these are didioxys. And uh, so one of the things that was noticed as the uh, sequences of some of these polymerases were being studied, and some of the resistance mutants and so on, it was noticed that the that the complex between the nucleotide, whether it's a deoxynucleotide <coughs> shown here with a 3' prime hydroxyl, which could then be extended by bringing in the next 5' prime triphosphate, this hydroxyl is near in space to the position on a phenylalanine or a tyrosine, position 762 of this polymerase, which can either, if it's a tyrosine that has an OH there, uh, and if it's a phenylalanine, you lose the O and you just have a hydrogen there. And when you have uh, the, the uh, phenylalanine there, there's a space, that, that, that uh, an appropriate space that accommodates the 3' hydroxyl quite well, but if you now may put in a dideoxy inhibitor, you now have too much space in there, 
and you start trying to fill that space with a, a other bulky molecules like water, and basically the, the binding constant becomes it becomes much less favorable binding when you have a when you're lacking both oxygens. So this would present an opportunity to engineer some polymerases which uh, had a uh, phenylalanine there to become more accepting of the didioxys and hence better uh, at using didioxys in, in DNA sequencing chemistry. And, and this was simply by engineering, putting in that oxygen there, by changing the phenylalanine to a tyrosine, it now made a better fit between, uh, you, could th you could think of it as, you can have either oxygen, and by removing this oxygen, you, you replace it with an oxygen on the protein side. It's, it's a, I'm trying to emphasize by a few examples here the idea of complementary surfaces and how you can engineer them. This is a beautiful case. Now we're talking about single atom rather than the complementary surfaces of the nucleic acids we were talking about before. This has an 8,000-fold effect on the specificity of this polymerase and a big impact on the genome project. Now, that's how we program a particular atom to uh, achieve an important goal. And, of course, the virus has its own mechanisms for programming it, uh, typically by random mutagenesis and selection, as we talked about in the population genetics. But the way we program in general proteins are either uh, transgenics, where we might uh, overproduce the protein, or homologous recombination, which is the ultimate, where we go in and if the protein is already, if the gene encoding the protein is already present, we can change that particular nucleotide in situ in the correct place so it's prep, properly regulated and everything. That's a great way to, to do it. Point mutants are not the only way to generate conditional mutants. Many of them historically were, but there are ways that you can program in conditional meaning that you can regulate under what conditions the protein is expressed or not, or active or not, with an entire domain or with single nucleotide polymorphisms. Now, so this is one way. This is, this is the nucleic acid way. Uh, another way is by modulating the activity of the proteins uh, from the outside with, with uh, drugs or drug-like molecules in chemical genetics. And under the subheadings for that, you can make these by combinatorial synthesis, and we'll show an example of that. The combinatorial synthesis can be based on design principles, not just completely random, uh, usually are. The design principles can take into account what you know about the nature of the interaction of, of similar proteins. And you can mine whatever uh, uh, biochemical data that you can collect for so-called quantitative structure activity relationships. This is a slightly different discipline than the, than the detailed crystallographic uh, and quantitative studies that we've been talking about so far. Here you're trying to basically mine through the uh, structures of the ligand itself for the parts of the ligand that might be responsible for the activity, the binding activity or the full biological activity that you see. So let's look at some examples of single nucleotide polymorphisms that we've been talking about before um, in a new, well, actually, this, this is a, a class that we didn't discuss before, but uh, in previous classes, but it's re related to what we've been talking about. In the case of the zinc finger, we made an altered specificity. We made new zinc fingers that bind to completely new uh, trinucleotides. With the DNA polymerase, we, by changing one amino acid, we could make it now accept almost four logs better, a, uh, an inhibitor that is very useful. And here, we have many different, many of these are enzymes uh, where you can not just knock out the enzyme, but actually make it recognize a new substrate or change radically the binding constant and catalytic uh, rate for new substrates. I, um, and, I, and I just have this long fine print slide just to impress with you. This is actually less than half of the list. Um, to just how many examples. These are not that unusual. And those, are, uh, and those can be designed or naturally occurring. Now, we're going to take the three-dimensional structure of proteins to connect and connect it with the, our discussion of uh, haplotypes and single nucleotide polymorphisms. And you may recall that uh, with one of the 
commonly occurring single nucleotide polymorphism uh, is the ApoE4 allele. It's present in 20% of the human population, even though it has uh, unfortunate consequences, we think, mainly uh, for Alzheimer's. Uh, it increases the risk of Alzheimer's and in probably increases cardiovascular uh, fitness through its uh, APO, APOE refers to its involvement in uh, cholesterol metabolism and transport. The APOE3 allele is present in about 80% and is far more common in human populations, but both of these would be considered very common alleles. And we also mentioned that the ancestral form of this, for example, found in chimpanzees at nearly 100%, is this arginine 112 instead of what's now common in human populations with cysteine 112. And that was one explanation for that might be that it was physiologically uh, our nutritional standards have changed. We now eat a lot more fatty things. We live long enough to get Alzheimer's. And so maybe this was something, this uh, was something that was, uh, this bad allele E4 was good in chimpanzees that have different diets or lifespans. But uh, the other possibility, and, and I can't really distinguish between these right now, but another one that's seriously consider, not just in this case, but in cases in general, is you no longer just think about single nucleotides, you think about haplotypes. Everything in cis on that DNA strand has a chance of affecting either the expression level of the protein or in cis on the protein strand to, to fold back and interact. And you can see that one of the nearest amino acids to this arginine 112, which is the, the dif main difference between ApoE4 and ApoE3, RT61 is the same on the two alleles, but you think of this as one haplotype, um, and in chimpanzees, the haplotype is now 3 and 61. And you can think that, that, that a 3 arge in chimps, uh, an or ancestrally, is not too different from an arge cis. So, so it'd be a different order. So it's like, it's like this compensating complementary mutation, just like we had the, in the, in the, uh, the oxygens in the polymerase a couple of slides ago, and you can think of the compensating mutations we had in mutual information theory for doing the tRNA structure. Think of complementary surfaces. When you think of, of uh, single nucleotides, don't think of them as a haplotype and co possibly complementing uh, constellations. Especially with, now, this, this brings us to the possible impact of three-dimensional structure on predicting deleterious human alleles. If we suddenly had the sequence of everyone in this room and, and we wanted our computer program to prioritize which ones should I pay attention to, which deviations from the, the uh, most common allele should I look at first, well, you might think of these things in terms of proteins. We've now gotten to the point in the course where we're talking about proteins. You need to think about the three-dimensional structure, who's near who in the structure. You can think about binding sites. These might be indicated by, the, if you know the three-dimensional structure, um, or you know the conservation pattern in this family of proteins. You can ask things about charge. In that last slide, we had the charge of the arginines being near a, uh, a, a compatibly uh, partial negative charge on the cysteines or, or uh, threonines. You can have a disulfide is a very important thing to lose. Um, it's highly, they tend to be highly conserved. Uh, if you introduce a, a proline into what would normally be an alpha helix, this is something where the th knowledge of the three-dimensional structure would say, oh, that proline, just a priori, without any knowledge of conservation, is, it could be a huge change in the three-dimensional structure. Um, and then these multi-sequence profiles are a, a good way of looking at the conservation. That's a way of prioritizing uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms that might have impact on pharmacogenomics or disease in general. Now, as we integrate that with the chemical diversity that we can create, that's going to be the topic for the next few slides, is how do we create chemical diversity? And I'm going to introduce this, the idea of chemical diversity, in a way I hope nicely connects to where we've been with RNA arrays. RNA arrays are, and the double-stranded DNA array that we used earlier in, in class today can be generated in a combinatorial sense. You can make an exhaustive set. Now, the, typically those were made where spatially they were isolated. Each different uh, 
nucleic acid, oligonucleotide, is present in a different place, identifiable to the computer by its coordinates on, a, on an array. But you can also make them in a, in, a, in a big mixture and use them as a mixture and do selection on them, as we did with the phage display. Or you can make them as a mixture of solid phase particles and then separate the solid phase particles out in some manner. Solid phase comes up again and again. In arrays, it's very obvious why you have a solid phase. You want to be able to address it by its positions in X and Y on the, on the array. Um, but the other reason, technical reasons are it's a fantastic way of getting purification of your products uh, by, simply by washing uh, rather than doing complicated purification procedures. And it allows you to, in the case of beads, they're now, so you can think of it as an ultimate and flexible array. You, it's, you can move the beads around and put them in new arrays uh, and identify them later. Anyway, so we're going to introduce the general way of making either um, complex chemicals, whether they're linear polymers like proteins or nucleic acids, or uh, much a more tighter uh, and small molecules, but they have similar concepts that you need. There's the solid phase that I already talked about. There's the idea of protection, protecting groups, um, such as, and the protecting groups are protecting against a reactive group. So the highly reactive group here is the phosphoramidite, which is this phosphate nitrogen bond. Uh, this is capable of reacting with just, just about uh, any uh, nitrogen or oxygen, such as this Eventually, once you deprotect this oxygen at the five prime position, remember th these two oxygens are five and three, just like the ones we've been talking about all along. This is the chemical synthesis version of the polymerase that we've been talking about. So you have these, protect these reactive groups and then protecting groups. Um, and that's, those are the major concepts. Now let's go through this. This is uh, the, the topic here is proteins. And we'll talk more about protein synthesis as part of uh, quantitation next time and as part of networks in the last three lectures. But here's a completely synthetic way of getting at, sh at short peptides, uh, either by directly synthesizing the peptides or synthesizing nucleic acid that encodes that peptide or interferes with the production of that peptide. And you can think of these as drug-like molecules. Uh, these are naturally related. They can be analogs of nucleic acids and proteins, not just straight uh, ones. And we'll talk about opportunities for making these analogs. Um, and so by making analogs of known proteins or nucleic acids, you kind of have a more immediate connection between the thing that your computer instructed the synthesizer to make and your targets. Well, if you make a, a random chemical, you don't necessarily know what your target is. But we'll talk about ways of making slightly less random chemicals. But this is one way of making a direct connection. And the process is... is cyclic in the sense that each cycle you, you return and, and, and uh, the, the polymer gets a little bit longer. You start with one monomer on a solid phase shown by these uh, uh, little hexagons on the far right side of the slide. And you add uh, a, a you, you remove the protecting group on the immobilized uh, polymer, one protecting group, and then you bring in this reactive group, otherwise protected, and, it, and there's, a, there's really one major product that you expect. You wash off all the excess, you now have it's one longer, you deprotect, this DMT group is removed, uh, and you go back up and cycle again. There, uh, there may be additional steps such as oxidation, which will stabilize the new bond that you've made, uh, or you could have a capping step that, that, can, uh, that can soak up any excess that was left over. But in general, after you're done with all these cycles, then there'll be, there'll be a step where you remove the protecting groups altogether and remove the polymer from the solid phase if you so choose, or you leave it there if you have an array. These are other examples of protecting groups. Uh, these are now on the bases. Some bases don't need protection, like thymines. Uh, if you have an exocyclic amine, then you typically need a benzoyl or an isobutyl group. In blue here uh, are the protecting groups. I said that there's the there's an opportunity here for having uh, modifying the oligo, the oligonucleotides or oligopeptides or other chemicals. Um, 
to make them so that they're uh, related to, but not ap identical in every property to uh, uh, normal constituents of your body or of the bacterial cell that you're aiming at. And why would you want to make derivatives? Why not make the exact thing? And the reason you want to make derivatives would be, for example, to increase their stability or decrease their stability or uh, make them bind more uh, faster or more irreversibly. And examples are, in the previous slide, you can make modified bases. And in slide 29 here, you can change the backbone itself. You can change the ribosis so that they have uh, bulky groups that prevent the nucleases from getting in. Or they could have uh, uh, exchange oxygen for sulfurs or hydrogens uh, in order to make the phosphodiester backbone itself, which is where nucleus is uh, cleaved, uh, a less attractive, less uh, energetically favorable substrate. Okay, so now those are <coughs> chemical processes that in a certain sense mimic the normal polymerases and ribosomes in the cell. And they're analogous processes to generate chemical diversity on smaller molecules. And, and then there are an analogous to that biological mechanisms by which you can make uh, so, uh, small molecule diversity, which are less cyclic than uh, the process we just talked about. These are, these are more uh, a, a, a set of ordered reactions that has a conceptual repeat, but uh, in a sense you can think of it as a linear t uh, program that uh, you go from the beginning to the end. And that's to make these uh, polyketides, which are shown on the right-hand side of the slide, a large class of, of, of uh, pharmaceuticals, including most of the antibiotics, are made by a fairly small uh, set of organisms, such as streptomyces and certain plants. And, and this process by which it's made, which will be illustrated in more detail in the next slide, is very akin to fatty acid synthesis. Fatty acids are long hydrocarbon chains, which you can think of adding each uh, two carbons on that fatty acid as a process akin to the one for making these polyketide drug-like molecules. Another way of making, uh, biologically making a very compact structure, which actually uses uh, uh, ribosomes, but it uses them to make very tight, short peptides and a precursor that then fold with dis lots of disulfides to make this uh, small, it's small and highly cross-linked. Now, the fact that, that, is, that these cone snails have gone, to, have gone to the trouble of making hundreds of these different uh, very small peptides of, that have these properties um, tells you something about what it is that you want, that, that drug-like molecules have in common. And that is that they, they're small, so that they diffuse quickly um, and get to their, their site. And so you can have large amounts of them in a small space, so you can manufacture lots of them. And, and they're, then they have to be highly cross-linked in order to maintain the rigidity. Because they're small, they have less surface area to bind to their, their uh, uh, binding pocket. So to compensate for that, they have to have a lot of rigidity. And the thing that you lock in rigidly has to be the correct structure. It does you no good to have a rigid structure that isn't really perfectly complementary to that surface. And the third source of biological diversity uh, is one you're probably more familiar with, which is the immune receptors, the B and T cell receptors, the antibodies, um, and cell-mediated immunity. And these use um, a recombinational machinery to, 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 to program uh, various combinations of uh, nucleic acid motifs that encode protein motifs. And as they do that recombination, they have further diversification that occurs due to a template-independent polymerase, terminal transferase, which will extend a few nucleotides of completely random nucleic acid sequence that, that, allow, that basically incredibly accelerates the, the rate of mutagenesis, basically generating sequence de novo. This is one of the examples in biology where you generate sequence de novo. And I think that's uh, very apropos of this uh, combinatorial topic. Now, this is a beautiful example from the previous slide. Those polyketides on the far right now are the star of this slide. 
And here, in a certain sense, nature has, and now scientists have, engineered protein modules to make these, uh, this linear sequence of events. You can think of here, you're using a, a, a linear set of protein domains to program a very complicated series of chemical reactions the same way the linear sequence of messenger RNA tells the ribosome to make a series of uh, additions in the protein. The, ribos the ribosome cycle, catalytic cycle, is, is a cycle, while this is more a linear tape, a linear series of events. The proteins themselves, these little arrow-shaped things with boxes in them along the top, uh, labeled module 1 through 6, those proteins are, of course, made on ribosomes. But then they act kind of like the solid phase synthesis where the acyl carrier protein, ACP, in the box binds to the, the, the first monomer and it starts transferring it from protein to protein along this multi-domain, huge protein. Um, and there's actually three proteins in a row here. And each of the steps are taken in order along the protein, and they involve things like a synthase step where you'll bring in another monomer, or a keto reductase step, KR, where you'll bring in, uh, where you'll re reduce uh, one of the double bonds, or uh, an acyl transferase step, AT. And so, and then you, but you can see each of these has a substrate specificity, and by changing the order of substrate specificities, you can build up a, a huge combinatorial uh, collection here in microbial communities and also in the laboratory. Now, protein interaction. We're just beginning to talk seriously about protein interaction assays. Uh, I think many of you either are or will be more and more familiar with the tip protein interaction assays. In next class, uh, we'll talk about uh, ways of getting direct information on protein through, through cross-linking cross and mass spectrometry. Another way is indirectly setting up these reporter assays where you take advantage of the binding properties of known proteins to analyze two unknown proteins. And so a known protein might be LexA, which binds to DNA, and B42, which activates transcription of a, something for which you have a good uh, visual assay, like here are three, um, life and death. And, uh, and by taking these two knowns, let's say in B42, which have known properties, but they only exert their properties when they're brought together, and they're only brought together if the unknown proteins, or partially known proteins, to which they're bound, interact with each other. Okay? And so this, this is a so-called two-hybrid assay, and uh, the variations on it, I think we mentioned one uh, where you can characterize nucleic acid protein interactions with a one-hybrid assay, and here you can inhibit this 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 interaction between the two uh, knowns, uh, sorry, unknowns or partially known molecules in blue. Here, uh, here's a, a TGF beta, a growth factor, and a uh, binding protein. You can in inhibit that with uh, a particular small molecule or a collection of small molecules, which can be introduced from one of these combinatorial syntheses. Uh, into a, an array of, of these cellular assays and you get these um, uh, information about you can either collect a big data set of proteins that interact from, from a proteomic scale experiment or small molecules that inhibit one or more of those interactions. This is a source of information which is intrinsically computational in the sense, well, in the sense that there's a large amount of it. You can model the three-dimensional structure of this interaction if you have sufficient data to do that, and you can model the impact of the small molecules in a structure activity sense. Now, if you look at the, the top right-hand part of slide 34 here, you can see this huge diversity of all these different colored shapes, and if you wanted to, if you wanted to use these in a combinatorial assay, you'd, you'd connect them in every pairwise combination and try them against your target by some bioassay. However, if that library is too large uh, either to make or to screen, typically to screen, then what you can do is you can study a part of the molecule and, see, and then take the subset of the diversity that, that, that can bind and, uh, uh, and then take that subset 
characterize it, and now make every, only the pairwise combinations of the two half molecules. And uh, generally speaking, uh, if, the, if the geometry is fairly rigid, then the binding constant will get, uh, will be roughly the product of the two binding constants. So if each one is, has a very low binding constant, then it will be, you know, roughly the square of that, and you get um, some point of diminishing returns eventually. So this is an example of a strategy where you use a little bit of prior knowledge, which can be em empirical or could be purely computational, about how to limit your library and make interesting combinations. Okay. Now that we've been talking mainly about the kind of chemical diversity we can get that's aimed at the ligands that can bind to target proteins, but now we want to talk about the source of information about those target proteins itself, which is another genomics project, a, a uh, um, structural genomics. And typically, we want to select targets for binding drugs or select targets for solving the structures of proteins in order to um, look at their ligands in more detail. And how can we do this? How can we decide which targets are high on our list to go for next? We have hundreds of proteins for which we have three-dimensional structures, and uh, from some of them we have um, information on what ligands they bind. But this, these are other criteria that are sometimes used in the field for uh, target selection. If they are homologous to previous interesting targets, uh, then that's a uh, that puts them on the high on the short list. If they are conserved, and we've talked about how important conservation is from time to time, um, then that might be a, 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 an approach. If they're conserved and you knock it out, um, then you might expect that to be lethal, and that might make it a good target for uh, a antibacterial. If you want to limit the action of your uh, therapy to the surface uh, in order to, say, reduce the uh, cross-reaction with internal molecules, you can sometimes restrict yourself to the surface acceptable proteins. And in fact, a very large class of drugs is aimed at surface accessible uh, membrane proteins. Uh, and, that, and so very often those are prioritized high. There are also the surface acceptable proteins are important if you're talking about vaccines, uh, which is an increasingly uh, important, or diagnostics that are non-invasive, uh, or at least not going to the interior of the cell. And there are ways, say with microarrays, that you can ask which genes are differentially expressed in the disease state, and that causes high prioritization. Now, once you have that prioritization, which comes from Geno say genome sequencing and some of those other facts, then we would like to have, you've got your target, you've got your genome sequence, uh, gene sequence for that target. How then do you get the three-dimensional structure that helps, helps you design um, drugs or improve the drugs that you have? Well, one a very uh, attractive approach given a protein sequence which might, you might get from their deluge of genome sequences, a practical approach might be to start with this genome sequence, this gene sequence which is 99.99% accurate and try to predict the three-dimensional structure of the protein and its ligand specificity. And if you walk through these, these are kind of ballpark estimates, some of them better than others, to get from the sequence to exons, we talked about this before, might be an 80%. Remember, these numbers really should be false positive, false negatives, and so on. But just ballpark, 80% getting to exons. Exons to genes, uh, if, you don't, if you aren't privileged enough to have this, the, the cDNA, then this is an uh, error-prone process with maybe a 30% success rate. Once you have genes, knowing its regulation, whether it's on or off in the particular cell types you're interested in, uh, is, is very difficult right now. Knowing the motifs is 
barely is, is barely a start on getting the full regulation. So I would say 10% or less. Once you have a regulated gene, getting the protein sequence is easy. That's the genetic code. Getting this from the sequence, the secondary structure is um, uh, easy in the context of some of these other things, but still the accuracy is only around 77%. I have next to this the, re the reference is, uh, is CAST, which is something that is a competition for computational assessment of three-dimensional structure prediction for proteins that's been held uh, since, I think, 94, and the next one is coming up in a couple of months. And this is kind of the big uh, race or bake-off between the different methods, very exciting, um, but unfortunately over decades it's still hovering around 77% for secondary structure and about 25% for ab initio, three-dimensional structure. Then even if you have the three-dimensional structure at adequate accuracy, getting the ligand specificity is problematic, and it depends on the ligand. If it's DNA, it's a good case. If it's a small molecule, it can be as low as 10% or worse. Now, since each of these are fairly independent uh, estimates, uh, you can get an approximate overall accuracy, which is a product of all those, which is dismally small at uh, uh, 0.0005. Uh, and so it behooves one to use as many extra experimental data as one can or improve the algorithms that are weakest in this this journey from genome sequence to uh, ligand specificity. We'll pick up this thread uh, right after a, a break and, uh, and carry on to actually how we get the three-dimensional structure, um, whether it's predictive or experimental, and the computational pass there. Thank you. Take a break.